I have another meal I want to share with you today. It's something different. Bacon, eggs, and bannock. Okay, Mark, what's different about bacon, eggs, and bannock? Well, okay, that's pretty much a, a common meal for people to have out in the woods, but what's going to be different about it today is, first, this is my latest variation or version of my low-carb bannock recipe, and the other thing is how I'm going to bake it. If you're interested, keep watching. You know, bacon and eggs is a classic meal to have out in the woods, and the nice thing about it is it's already a low-carb meal all by itself. It's well into the ketogenic range of meals that you can have out in the woods. But we love adding our bannock to it, and bannock is just one of those things. It's traditional, it's classic, it's good. Yeah, you have to have bannock with your bacon and eggs. The problem with bannock is a traditional recipe is extremely high in carbs. It's all processed flour and things that will spike your blood insulin greatly. So I've been working for some time to come up with something that is at least a reasonable alternative to the traditional bannock recipe, and I think I'm pretty close. So what I thought I would do is I'd take you down to my prep spot next to the fireplace here. I'll go over the recipe for the bannock because I have to get that on and baked first. And then, of course, I'll do up the bacon and eggs afterwards. All right, so I have my ingredients laid out in front of me here to start with. Here is my bannock recipe, which I'll tell you all about in a moment, sitting in the bowl. Here are my eggs that I'll be cooking up after the bannock is baked. And here is some bacon. Now this is different than traditional bacon. This are end chunks off a of thick cut bacon. It's sold here as bean bacon. So if you're making brown beans at home, you might buy this and toss in to add fat and flavor. But they work really well fried up over uh, a gas stove as I'll be doing today. And finally, here is my olive oil and ghee. It is the ghee that I'll be using to mix in with the bannock recipe. So I did say I had to get the bannock on first. I will give you the ingredients uh, to give you an idea of what the evolution of my bannock recipe is. But of course, I'll put this in per in the video description below in the exact measurements that I'm using here today so that you, if you want to give it a try, you can. So in this bag, we have one quarter cup of almond flour, one quarter cup of coconut flour, one full teaspoon of baking powder, three quarter teaspoon of xanthan gum, one teaspoon of oat fiber, one table, or sorry, one tablespoon of oat fiber, one tablespoon of pea protein, one tablespoon of whole milk powder, one tablespoon of dehydrated eggs, egg powder, and to this I'll be adding two tablespoons of ghee and about five tablespoons of water. I'll just slowly add the water until it gets to the right texture, but when I did it at home, it's about five tablespoons is what it takes. All right, just a few comments on the ingredients. So I have been experimenting. It's not that I want to get away from almond flour, it's just that I want to see what else I can come up with that might give it a little bit of a different flavor profile and a different color. So as an alternative to almond flour, I've been trying lupin flour, and I really like lupin flour. If you're not familiar with it, look it up. It is a higher protein flour, low in carbohydrates, high in fiber, just about everything you would want from a flour. You don't use it by itself. Usually you use it in combination with another flour like almond flour to get the best results from it. And same thing with coconut flour. It doesn't do well on its own either, but it has some advantages. It may be a little bit higher in carbohydrates and it may absorb a lot more liquids than the others do but it also gives a lighter texture and color to the end product which is kind of important baking powder is uh, goes without say, saying the next couple of ingredients are intended to be added for fiber and for binding agents xanthan gum is traditional in and adding to things to help them stick together and that's one of the things you need in a recipe like this since there is no gluten this is gluten free you need something to help bind it together. Oat fiber, uh, not only does it add a nice flavor to the, to the uh, uh, end product, it also helps to bind it together, as does the pea protein and the whole milk powder. And finally, the egg powder. Now, when it comes to egg powder, you could use one whole egg with this, and I have done that. Um, they're about the same. I actually get a better result from the egg powder than I do from a whole egg. If you're going to use a whole egg, you're going to use a lot less water, probably be three to four tablespoons as opposed to five or so tablespoons that I'll have to add here. Okay, so that's the ingredients. And as I mentioned, I will put them in the video description. Let's get this going. So let me pour all the dry ingredients into my bowl here. 
stash that so it doesn't blow away. A bit windy here today. And, all right. I do have a spoon. I'm going to try and measure... Oh, oh sorry, it's the ghee first, not the water. Do add the ghee, Mark. Now, recipe calls for two tablespoons. Try and be precise if you're doing this at home, just so you get an idea what, uh, what the end result will be. But honestly, if you have a little bit more or a little bit less ghee, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. In fact, I don't think I'm going to be able to do a precise measurement. I just push down a bit of a well in the center of the powdered ingredients here. And I'm guesstimating one tablespoon, two tablespoon. You can see how liquid the ghee is. Look it up before I make a mess with it. All right. And I'm going to mix that through first as well as you can. It's not going to mix completely and uh, cleanly through all of it, but just try to blend it around a little bit. It'll make the next step a little easier when you go to add the water. See it's sticking there. And it doesn't take very long, just takes a second to mix that through. It's not like trying to mix shortening or butter through um, a, a regular bannock mix where you're trying to make a fully crumbly mix. If you can get to that point here, that's great, but it's not necessary. You'll, you'll get the same texture either way, just as long as it's fairly well mixed through. And I think you can see it's a little bit crumbly, but not completely crumbled through. Some of the crumbles are bigger than others, but that's all right. That's where we'll stop. Now let's add the water. So I'm going to start with three spoonfuls. And see where that takes us. I know that's not going to be enough, but... Nope, not anywhere near enough. Right. Add another spoon. Maybe I'll add two more spoonfuls. If it turns out a little bit wet, that's okay. Let it set for a few minutes. The ingredients inside, especially the coconut flour in this case, will soak up the moisture and it'll give you a nice consistent uh, dough when you're finished. In fact, I think you'll find that um, if you give it a few seconds, it'll actually be better than trying to use it right away. It actually, as I mentioned, firms up and, and holds together better when you go to cook. So that's five spoonfuls, but this, these are not quite tablespoons, so number six spoonful. Uh, one of the things I find about this recipe over a traditional wheat flour recipe is, in a traditional one, if you exceed the amount of water that is required to bring everything together, you can get a quite a, a bit of a messy dough that can be hard to handle. My experience here, um, it's going to soak in. So, you know, it's a little bit more forgiving in terms of soaking in. Now that is pretty close. When I find that it's not sticking to the outside of the bowl, I know I'm pretty much there. The only thing is, I think I see a little bit of powder left. So, one more. So now, in fact, with this recipe, the dough should be a little tacky on the outside when you go to pick it up with your hands. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we are. That's where I want it to be. Now, make sure your hands are clean for the next step because you are going to pick it up to form your patty. No different than any other bannock. Yeah. All right. That'll work. That'll work just fine. Now, I'll show you what I'm going to, how I'm going to form the patty, and then I'll set this up over the burner so that you can see how I'm going to bake it. I have a little stainless steel dinner plate here, and I have one of those uh, barbecue mats, the type you might put on your barbecue. They're a heat resistant mat. I like, I prefer actually using a parchment paper, but the nice thing about these is they're reusable. So that's what I am going to use today. So that is my cooking vessel. Now I'll pick up the dough. And it is a little bit tacky on the outside. A couple little pieces put left behind. All right, no magic here. All I'm doing is just forming a patty. I'm looking for something about three and a half, three to three and a half inches in diameter, maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch thick. There, all right, so that's it. That's all ready to go. So for the next stage, I have to set my burner up and my improvised oven, and I'll show you doing that.
So here's my setup for my baking today. Today uh, is another fire ban day, and so I can't have a fire, which is, would be my preference, of course. And often when there is a fire ban on, I'll bring out one of my wood stoves and use charcoal in it, which of course we are allowed to do. But I decided today, since I already have this stove out here, to do a review on that I would show how you can bake using a gas stove. So this is the Bulin BL100-B15 remote canister gas stove. And one of the things I think it'll make it great for baking on is, well, look at the size of that burner. It is huge. It is very wide. Now, this is intended to be used with a separate pot that I have uh, that I'll be reviewing in the other video. And this the Bulin S2400, yes, S2400 1.5 liter pot with a heat exchanger, and they're designed to nest together. But you know what? This works just fine for what I'm going to be doing today because not only the big burner, but look how wide the profile that is. That'll support some big pans on it, and I am going to be using a pan to do my baking with. So let's get this started. So it doesn't come with a built in piezoelectric lighter, you have to use this one that they supply with it. Here we go. I'll turn that down for a second. It's a fairly quiet stove and it does have a nice wide range of flame on it, so it works out pretty good. So let's get this on. I'm using my Pele pan to bake with, and inside of the Pele pan, I'm using that little cast iron fry pan as heat sink and spacer. And I think this is a, a really good test of the two of them together because traditionally gas stoves tended to create hot spots in the center of whatever pan or pot you're using. I think this stove has the benefit of having that wide burner, but I'm making the most of it by putting this cast iron pan inside of it, which will act as the heat sink and hold a lot of heat at the same time dispersing the heat and preventing any hot spots. So there is my bannock in the little uh, steel cook plate on top of that little piece of non-stick material. Ready to go. One last thing to do, get the pie plate on upside down. Now, if you were doing this at home, uh, 375, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 minutes would probably do it um, out here in the woods. And actually, this is the first time that I'll be cooking over a gas stove or doing this baking over a gas stove. So this is gonna be a watch and see. The only way to do it is look at it every once in a while test it with a toothpick to see where we're at and then go from there. It's hard to estimate. I'm thinking about 15 minutes. I did check once and I felt it was probably done, but I wanted to give it another couple minutes. Now I can smell it. Hopefully I haven't gone too long. This pan is hot. Whoop. It's starting to burn a little bit on the bottom, I think. Let me just double check with my toothpick. Absolutely clean. Okay. Stove is turned off. I have to take this off of the burner. I'll set the bannock aside and I'll set back up to do my bacon and eggs. All right, let's light the stove up. Turn the gas on. Get my sparker ready. There we go. I'm gonna turn that down nice and low. Still hear it though, just barely. Get my fry pan on. Now I'm gonna put a spot of ghee in here just to give the bacon a head start because I think I may have burnt off some of my seasoning in that baking process. Oh. Okay, here comes the bacon. Sizzling already. So you can see the size of these chunks. It's just big chunks of bacon is what it is. Good sized chunks of meat, lots of fat. Turn that heat down a little bit more. All right, that's good. Keep these moving. Come back in a few minutes when these are finished. Now that bacon is looking great. So what I think I'll do is just push it to the edge of the fry pan. Maybe just pull it slightly off the heat. All I'm doing is just making some space here. There's some bacon fat still sm smoking in there, as you can see. I gotta get that eggs in. Now, normally you want eggs to cook at a much 
lower temperature than this is going to afford me, so this isn't going to take very long for these things to fry. Uh, let's hope I don't ruin them that way. I think they're going to be okay. Oop, I think I got shell in there. I'm usually better than that. Can I get that shell out? Yep, shell's out. Good. All right. It's out now, anyway. All right, eggs are cooking. So this uh, burner, even at its lowest temperature, is still putting out a significant amount of heat, more than I would normally use for cooking eggs. But not too bad. And it doesn't seem to be creating the hot spot that a lot of other gas burners do, which is of course exactly what I did want to see happen. I think I have about one moment to get some spice on there before it's too late. Almost forgot the spices. Put a little something on my eggs anyway. Garlic. And maybe some Cajun. And I think those eggs, if I, I'm going to flip them, now's the time to flip them. Let's see if I can get that done. Oh, I don't know. A little bit stuck. Let's see. Oh, well, they're not doing too bad. Actually, they're not quite as cooked as far along as I thought they were. There's still some looseness in the white. I don't think that's going to work. I'll just hold on to them for a second. I think over easy or sunny side up, either way, it's going to work just fine. I think, yeah, these are very close to being done and I'll get them transferred onto the plate and we'll do a taste test. Dinner is served. Let me see if I can give you a show. So the eggs didn't stick to the pan as badly as I thought they were going to be. Actually, they weren't really stuck. They're just perfect. I was just nervous trying to flip them. Bacon looks good, and there's the bannock. All right, let's do some taste tests. Still not up quite far enough. Not that it'll do. Okay, where's my napkin? Still quite hot. Piece of the bacon. What can you say? It's bacon, right? You can't really go wrong with bacon. The thicker cuts of this bean bacon, as it's called, give it more of a meaty te texture than regular bacon would. But all the flavor is definitely there. Let me know if you have bean bacon where you're at, or if they refer to it as bean bacon, maybe they give it another name. I've seen it also referred to as lardons, which are just basically thick cut bacon sliced into little fries almost, little pieces, so that works as well. Hmm. I know what you're looking for. How about the bannock? Not burnt, just browned. I caught it in time. Oh! Ho, 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 ho. Hope that's focusing in there. My face is out of the way it should. Light, fluffy. Yeah. Nice smell. All right. This is the best bannock recipe that I have come up with yet. Low carb alternative to normal traditional wheat flour type bannock. Moist, tender, light, uh, good color. There is a bit of a flavor on it that is non-traditional. It's a bit of a nutty flavor. And I suspect that nutty flavor is coming from almonds, the almond flour, which is really just ground up almonds, and the oat fiber. Neither are objectional, they're just a little bit different, that's all. I've got all kinds of ideas for alternatives, so why did I do that? Get my fork out. 
Because what's the purpose of bannock with bacon and eggs? Soak up the eggs, right? Hmm. <laughs> Break off a little piece of bannock, dip it in the eggs. So, you know, it's funny. When the, my kids were growing up, uh, they called these plunk eggs, meaning you plunked something in them, right? Did you call them plunk eggs? I didn't when I was growing up, but my kids did. How about you? Mm. Oh, man. How can such a simple meal be so satisfying? I know, because it's cooked in the woods, right? And that's definitely part of it. All right, I'm quite impressed with the way that stove from the Boulin stove managed to keep things from burning because one of the traditional problems you have with cooking over a gas stove is hot spots in the center. But uh, if you keep your things moving as best you can, keep the temperature down low, use a little bit of oil or fat to fry in, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you should, you should avoid the problems with most gas stoves. This one just makes it a little bit easier because of that wide burner it distributes the heat uh, across the, uh, the whole thing. Now, here's something, a couple of things I want to mention about the Bannock. You saw me use something. I didn't explain it. I have used it in another video, and it was that small, round, cast iron fry pan. It's a small six and a half inch fry pan that has about a half inch clearance on the sides. I took the handle off with my uh, angle grinder and I've been using that for exactly what you've seen, baking. It seems to be a perfect thing to add to smaller pans. Now if you can get your hands on a really small pizza stone that might be better but my pizza stones, the eight inch ones I have, are just a little bit too big for that fry pan. I think they're nine inch pizza stones. So I was looking for something that would be multifunctional and that little cast iron thing is actually lighter than the pizza stone, smaller, does a really good job of being a heat sink and providing a spacer. So it's been a couple times I've used it out here over uh, wood fire and gas and it's worked perfectly for baking with. So that's the thing I wanted to say about that. Uh, the other thing is the bannock. I think with this bannock recipe, I could do a couple things. I could have added my sweetener, the monk fruit, and made more of a dessert bannock out of it, something like a cake. It would have worked well. Or I could have turned it into a cheese bread. And I think the two ways I might have done that was use powdered cheese, like Parmesan or three cheese powder, and rolled them right into the recipe when I was making it. Alternatively, uh, grated cheddar or grated mozzarella rolled into the dough as I was making it. Either way, you could have, I could have made a cheese bread out of it, and I think it would have come out tasting well. Get some of these eggs before they get cold. Mm. Big chunk of bacon fat with some bacon attached. Mm. Little bit chewy, but that's the case with the, that chunk, those types of chunks of bacon. Okay, I guess what I'll do now is ask you uh, your thoughts on what I came up with today and this recipe. The bannock recipe, the bacon, the eggs, the way I cooked it. If you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comment section under this video. Uh, let me know if you try this bannock recipe. Try it at home first. Make sure it works for you there before you're going out in the wood. I use powdered eggs. You can use one whole egg. Just cut back on the water. You're looking for a dough that you can pick up with your hands, maybe tacky, but it's not powdery and it's not sticking to the sides of the bowl. So somewhere in between. Form the patty, let it set aside. That doubled in size. So that's the, the baking powder in it. It worked just perfectly. Yeah, this is great. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this will wrap around a stick That'll be my next experiment, or put it on a board, or set it up right in a, I think if I tilt it up in a fry pan facing the fire, that should work and keep its shape. But wrapping it around a stick, I'm not sure how well that'll work. There's only one way to find out, is to try, so I'll do that once we're allowed to have fires again. Okay, that's all I have for you today. I'm gonna to finish my lunch, and then make some coffee. Get out and explore. Take that path less travel, because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.